Good evening and welcome to the March 26, 2012 Midland Board of Education regularly scheduled meeting. Madam Secretary, would you call roll, please? I'd be happy to. President Malls? Here. Vice President Wasserman? Here. Mayor Baker? Here. Mr. Oley? Here. Member Brandstad? Here. Ms. Gordon? Here. And Dr. Kaminsky? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, we will proceed with a consent agenda. Is there anything on the consent agenda uh, that anybody would like to move or discussion or comments before we proceed with that? Seeing none, we'll start with the consent agenda with 2.1, the approval of regular minutes from the Monday, March 12, 2012 meeting. 2.2 is the following staff members have announced the resignation effective date indicated. 2.3 is the approval of the payment of the school, bill, uh, school systems bills for 20, January 2012, uh, and the amount is there attached. 2.3 is a, a breakdown of that. 2.3B is the investment report for uh, February 2012. 2.3C is a listing of purchase orders exceeding $3,000. 2.3D is a listing of purchase card transactions exceeding $3,000. And 2.4 is the approval and re uh, request for the authorization of the following legal bills to Seekers and Wardell. Move we'll approval of consent items 2.1 through 2.4. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley, supported by Mr. Wasserman. Any questions or comments? If not, motion on the table. Signify all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <coughs> motion carries. Request to address the board. And Cindy, if you would help us, please, with. Uh, who is first on that list, please? Sarah? If you'd state your name and uh, address and affiliation to the, to the district, please. And I would uh, like to also remind everybody that, uh, in fairness to everybody here this evening, that five minutes would be the rule of thumb for uh, the time at the uh, podium, please. And we'll turn it on. And um, I will have a child in fall that hopefully will attend uh, Midland Public Schools. <clears throat> in a class, all choices and behaviors can be classified as either a help or a hurt. For four years here in Midland, I've had the pleasure to teach kindergarten through eighth grade Spanish at Mills, Longview, East Lawn, and St. John's. Also sixth and eighth grade science and keyboarding at Northeast Middle School. In each of these varied classrooms, all choices can be broken down into those two easy categories, help or hurt. <clears throat> Standing back while someone gets bullied is a hurt. Standing up for someone no matter the consequence is a help. Standing here today, I'd like to remind everybody that we're on the same team. Our goal is the same, to provide the best education possible to our students. It's not union versus board or teachers versus administration. We are on the same team. We want to help our students. Now, some members of our team have more control or power, and that's how teams work. <clears throat> a hurt would be if those people disregarded what's best to win, to beat the other side. A help would be to consider the independent conclusions and find a way to compromise. No one loses. So what can I say that would help the situation? Would it help if I told you I regret getting my master's degree because now I can't afford my student loan payments? <clears throat> would it help if I told you that I work two other jobs to pay my bills each month? A hurt would be if I had to quit head coaching Science Olympiad to get another job because of a pay cut. A help would be if I felt secure in my job and not worried that my pay will be cut drastically and without reason. A hurt is knowing that some administrators have gotten pay raises while programs are cut, class sizes are getting bigger and the teachers have no contract. A help will be when a contract is agreed upon that does not have a losing side. We can be better than the bureaucrats in Lansing we can be better than the nonsense in Washington, and we can choose to help our students. Thank you. Carl? 
Before I get started tonight, I would like to state that my comments tonight are directed at the people sitting in front of me, not at the people at the building level. I appreciate and respect the leadership and support that I have received from my building administrators. My name is Carl Hoffman. I live in Sanford, Michigan. I have worked for Midland Schools for 17 years. I have spent 16 of my years as a counselor at Northeast Middle School. I have felt it necessary to speak to all of you directly in light of what has been going on around here lately. And quite frankly, I am downright angry. I think back to what I have done for Midland Public Schools the past 17 years, and then I think about what all of you have done the past two years. And yeah, I'm upset. What did I do the past 16 years at Northeast? Volunteered thousands of hours and spent thousands of dollars to support Midland Public Schools and their students. Never missed a school dance or party. Didn't get paid for that. Never missed a parent info night. Didn't get paid for that. Passed out schedules in the summertime. Didn't get paid for that. Had to drive students and athletes home after school or games. Didn't get paid for that. Worked on the scoreboard at every Northeast football game. Didn't get paid for that. Attended plays, concerts, and choir recitals. Those kids needed to see me and needed to know that I supported them. I coached head-to-head -head and academic track. Didn't get paid for that. I worked for the anti-bullying and violence teams. Didn't get paid for that, but I believe Ken Molt did. I worked at the track meets as a timer. I didn't get paid for that. Attended hundreds and hundreds of sporting events to support student athletes. Why? It was the right thing to do. Those kids needed me. Worked at the citywide track meets. Didn't get paid for that. Worked at the paddle in tournaments. Didn't get paid for that. Hung thousands of anti-violence bullying signs and messages throughout the schools. Didn't get paid for that. I would help set up, tear down for award ceremonies, parent-teacher conferences, and school parties. Didn't get paid for that. I would take students to breakfast, lunch, walk them to 7-Eleven, and buy them Slurpees for rewards as part of their behavioral plans. Didn't get paid for that. In fact, I paid for that. I spent hundreds of hours before and after school getting kids organized, packing their book bags, cleaning their lockers, feeding them dinner, buying them snacks, helping them with homework, filling out planners. Didn't get paid for that. My job didn't end at 3 o'clock, like most people would say. That's when it started on some days. Now, let's talk about what I did during the day. The part of my day that aren't in my job description, but needed to be done. Why? Because I love these schools these kids and it was the right thing to do. Monitored the lunchroom. I have a duty-free lunch. I never took it. I would take the kids outside for fresh air or to the gym to exercise. I would watch kids and homework hang out. In between lunches, I would clean tables, sweep floors, push in chairs, and even take out garbage. These kids deserve a clean lunchroom and it was the right thing to do. Other things I did for kids. Some kids needed clothes, I bought them clothes. Some kids needed book bags, shoes, books, hats, gloves, sportswear, sports equipment, party goods, and food. Hell, I even bought beds and mattresses and bedding for kids and delivered them to their house. This was not part of my job description. I did these things because it was the right thing to do for kids and for the district. So I'm not the kind of guy who needs constant praise, but you know, Sometimes it's nice to hear that you're appreciated when you work this hard. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. The people that sit before me never thank me or said we appreciate all you do. They have no idea what I did the past 17 years. I never saw that at any, at any of these events I went to. Why not? Why can't they chaperone a dance or come and watch a football game or even monitor the lunchroom? They are supposed to be the experts that know what is right for kids but they don't support kids at all. Last year, the money they saved by cutting counselors, four teaching positions in middle school sports, all friendly, all kid-friendly things, they bought nine new school buses with the money. Did we need nine new school buses when we don't hardly use the ones we have? Wouldn't it have been better for students to keep the programs that directly affect your kids in place? I sure think so. Let's, let's take a look at my counseling position the past few years. In 1996, I had a caseload of about 450 students. In 2001, I had a caseload of about 600 students. In 2011, I had about 900 students. No wonder why bullying is at its worst around here now, huh? You should be concerned about the amount of violence and bullying 
by eliminating counselors, counselors, look what you have created as a result. You should be ashamed of your actions. After my caseload was doubled, I had to take a 3% pay cut. More work, less pay. Hmm, that sounds familiar. I always hear that people in front of me value my work ethics and integrity when the camera is on. They appreciate all that I do when I'm working with the public school kids, when the public is watching. So when I learned that counseling had become expendable to the children in Midland, I was forced to leave Northeast Middle School and become a PE teacher at Jefferson and Seabird. Here's how I was valued by the, char by the people in charge. The job was to teach third through eighth grade. No support from the district to get started in this. I was given six different schedules in late August. No one could decide where or what I was doing. I was prevented from being prepared. When, I f when did I finally get my schedule? The day school started. Valued, huh? I had no time to be prepared. No curriculum was around for me to study to decide on my lessons. Yes, PE has a curriculum, and if not fo followed, I may get a negative evaluation. I had no computer, yet I was supposed to keep track of grades and attendance electronically. <coughs> Pretty hard to do without a computer. But don't forget, I'm valued, right? I had no keys to even open the gym door. In fact, I still have no gym key to Jefferson, and I'm the PE teacher. I'm valued, though, huh? This semester, a new class was formed, seventh and eighth grade topics for teens. I found this out a week before the class began, and now I am teaching it. It's hard to be prepared and be a prof professional in this environment, but I am valued, right? I feel like I'm being bullied by the people sitting in front of me. We talk a lot about bullying and how students shouldn't do it. It's not the right thing to do. Midland Public Schools leaders are not leading by example. I feel they are bullying teachers and staff. Definition of bullying is using your power or authority to cut down, belittle, or make someone feel less important. That is what is going on with this contract. After the facts, other facts about employee ratios and salaries from the top to the rest of the valued teachers, the grounds department is down four positions as compared to 2009. Teaching positions are down 40 positions since 2009. Administration is down one position since 2009. What does that mean? Well, the fact finder put it in plain English for me. The fact finder showed how the teacher to pupil ratio was increasing while the administrator to student was decreasing and administrator to teacher was decreasing. In other words, administrators were working less, teachers were working more. Why should two people with the same amount of education have $100,000 difference in their salary? Teachers touch students' lives daily and can make fifty dollars to $100,000 less than administrators. Many administrators making this contract dispute a huge problem have zero contact with students and make well over $100,000 a year. They have the power and are using it to bully your kids and teachers, not support us. Finally, I would like to share a story with you. A few weeks ago, I was at the Michigan High School Wrestling State Finals. As a young man from Bullock Creek was getting his hand raised for winning, I noticed the man sitting next to me was crying. I went up to the man, shook his hand, and said, I don't know who you are, but congratulations. You must really be proud of that young man. He looked up at me with tears in his eyes and said, I am the superintendent of Bullock Creek. I thought, how cool is that? Not only is the superintendent supporting this young man's efforts, but he has tears of joy in his eyes for him. I know for sure none of the Midland Public School leaders were watching the young man that represented Midland Public Schools at the state finals, and they damn sure weren't crying when he won. The leaders of MPS have shown by their exact actions that they think they are better than the students and teachers. They obviously look down on teachers and the job that we do. The information found by the fact-finding team makes it clear to me that this contract is not a money issue, it is an ego issue. Well. Well, I'm here to tell you that teachers of Midland Public Schools are worthy, and it's time for the people sitting in front of me to start treating us as equal partners, not as peasant workers. Please support Midland Public Schools teachers. We don't just talk the talk when it comes to caring about students. We walk the walk. Hoorah.
Andrew Scott. <coughs> and I'd let's like to remind you, everyone, that uh, in, to be in courteous, uh, being courteous to everybody here tonight, to limit your remarks to the five minutes. Uh, Carl was on a roll, so we let him go. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Andrew Scott. I live at 612 East Grove Street. I'm part of a Midland Public Schools family. My wife and I are both educators for the district, and our two daughters are students at Eastlawn Elementary. The one question that must be asked that will shed light on who teachers are is, why do people become educators? Sure, the average person thinks people become teachers for the summer months, the extended vacations at Christmas and spring break. However, the overwhelming majority of us become educators for the same purpose that doctors, police officers, and firefighters all choose their respective profession. They have genuine interest in helping others. I chose to teach at MPS because of its reputation for excellence, support for its educators, and I wanted to meet the challenge of high expectations. Outside of parents, I have the most vital job in this country, educating children. That is a tremendous responsibility that is bestowed upon anyone who carries the torch of education. That is not a calling I take lightly. However, over the past five or so years, my colleagues and I have been taking on more and more responsibilities, including educating, assessing, remediating, counseling, coaching, nurturing, and sometimes even parenting. In order to meet these increasing challenges and responsibilities, both my wife and I have worked hard to earn master's degrees. In the instance of my wife, she achieved a master's degree that was never compensated nor recognized. Like most teachers, we knew that choosing this profession would never make us wealthy. However, we did anticipate that we'd make an honest living. We, like most of us, just want to be able to provide for our families. We're simply asking for a fair wage that matches our educational level. We're not asking to stay at zero. We're asking to take less, in fact, just not catastrophically less. <clears throat> the bargaining teams for both the MCEA and the Midland Public Schools have recognized the bargaining process. That process involves a state-appointed fact finder that both sides recognize. The fact finding process sheds accurate light on the district's financial status. The numbers are real and transparent. The fact finder has made her best recommendation for this district's financial well-being while providing a fair and equitable solution to MCEA membership. It would be wrong for the district to impose something greater than what the fact finder has suggested. In fact, one question that keeps coming to my mind is, while we are still putting money in the bank, why haven't we restored any of the vital and essential programs that have been cut, such as reading recovery, media specialists, an adequate amount of computer lit and lab for all students? and counselors at all levels. Many others, including myself, would like to have an answer to that question. In closing, I'd like to end with what I'll call the Steve Lampson story. Steve and I are close friends who went to high school together. Steve graduated from Michigan State with a bachelor's degree in packaging engineering and a 3.85 GPA. After our graduation, we were sharing drinks and celebrating our upcoming futures. He'd just been hired for a corporate job with Kraft Foods, and I had just been hired by Midland Public Schools. When he and I raised our glasses and toasted, Steve looked at me and said, here's to you making a difference and me making money. <laughs> Steve knew that he would be making a much higher salary in the corporate world, but he also knew he would never have the same impact that I as an educator would have. He would be financially wealthy, but I would be truly rich. Thank you. Stephanie? <clears throat> My name is Stephanie Villarreal, and I live at 2207 Wilmington Drive. I teach elementary art at Chestnut Hill, Plymouth, and Midland Christian. I started teaching in Midland in 1998 when I was hired to teach Spanish part-time at East Lawn Elementary. Over the years, I've worked in many different buildings. In addition to East Lawn and my current schools, I've taught at Mills, Carpenter, Longview, Woodcrest, Adams, St. Bridget, Central, Jefferson, Midland High, and Northeast for two or three weeks, such as the life as of an auxiliary teacher. I'm here tonight because I'm worried about the future of Midland Public Schools. 
Of particular concern to me are the teacher pay cuts and increased class sizes that are being proposed by the district right now. I grew up in a small town on the west side of the state and went to the school in a very small, financially strapped school district. Obviously, I did not know back then that the school I attended was in financial trouble. I did know that when I went to kindergarten at a school that was only a mile or two from my home. That school was closed at the end of the school year, and I started first grade in a new elementary school that was quote unquote in town. I remember hour long bus rides to and from school. I remember that the music teacher that I had had in first and second grade became my classroom teacher in third grade when the music program was cut. I remember my parents having to figure out how to get me to school when I was in fifth or sixth grade when all busing was cut. I remember having very limited class choices when I was in ninth grade. It was truly a district facing dire circumstances. When I was a student studying education at Central Michigan University, many of my classmates talked about Midland Public Schools. They talked about what a great place it was to work. At the job fair, the line to drop off resumes to MPS was at least an hour long. I didn't know what all the hype was about since I didn't grow up around here. I left my resume with several other school districts in the hour I would have spent in that line. How I came to be hired here is a story for another time. After I started working here, I began to understand what all the talk was about. I saw neighborhood schools where many of the students walked instead of riding buses. I saw strong auxiliary programs in the elementary and even a new Spanish program. I saw lots of other programs in place to help elementary students get the right start. I saw lots of class choices for middle and high school students that would prepare them for life after graduation. I saw a community of people, paras, teachers, counselors, social workers, therapists, media specialists, building managers, custodians, office professionals, principals, coordinators, directors, school board members, and a superintendent working together to make sure that students in this di district had multiple opportunities for success. I felt like I was an important part of a team working in the best interest of children. The last few years have been different. Funding has decreased, we all know that. Schools have closed, programs have been cut, class choices have been reduced. Even so, MPS is still a long way from the school I grew up in. MPS is not f facing dire circumstances. How would it be possible for a district in dire circumstances to put money in the bank year after year? How would it be possible for a district in dire circumstances to purchase nine new buses in one year? How would it be possible for a district in dire circumstances to give raises to some administrators? How would it be possible for a district in dire circumstances to be able to afford a new administrative position? It just doesn't make sense to me. The last few years have been different. There are fewer people on the team. Many parts of that team don't even exist anymore. The parts that are left are working harder than ever to try to make up for the loss. Even more unfortunate, some of the parts that are left don't seem to be working together anymore. I feel that some parts are no longer working in the best interest of children. I have a daughter who will turn two in May. It seems like just yesterday she was a newborn. Before I know it, I will be attending kindergarten orientation for her. I've always assumed that I would send her to Midland Public Schools. I'm a public school teacher and I believe in public education. I have worked with many outstanding teachers during my years at MPS and I would be thrilled to have my daughter in their classrooms. These teachers have put and continue to put their students first. These teachers come in early, stay late, come in on weekends, work through lunch hours, spend money out of their own pockets. Every year they are asked to do more with less. Most of them, doing it, most of them do it without even thinking twice. If it is in the best interest of students, they do it willingly and selflessly. However, there is only so much one person can do. Increasing class size puts a much heavier burden on every teacher. It decreases one-on-one -on -one time he or she can spend with each student. I do not want to see my daughter in a kindergarten classroom with 27 students. I do not want her to be in a fifth grade class of 30. I do not want her to be in a 10th grade class of 32. Increasing class size is not what is best for students. I urge all of you to please think about what is in the best interest of our children. Is putting more money in a savings account in their best interest? I truly do not think so. Thank you. Sally?
Hi, my name is Sally Paulus. I live at 1428 Airfield Lane. I'm speaking to you because I am concerned. I was educated by Midland Public Schools and was tremendously proud when I accepted my, teaching, my first teaching job here in Midland. I had several other offers at other school districts, but I wanted to come to Midland because it was the best. I am worried now because we are not giving students the same educational experience that, we were, that they were receiving five or ten years ago. I know that because I see it happening right in front of me each and every day. I understand when budgets were cut, we had to get lean. We cut programs and staff that help students educationally and socially. It was horrible to be a part of that. What I don't understand now is when did Midland Public Schools become a banking institution instead of a school system? <laughs> Why is it okay to have over $14 million in the spendable savings account when we haven't returned reading recovery to our students? Isn't our number one job to teach kids to read? Reading recovery did that to those to, for those students who struggled the most. It gave those students the best chance in life to catch up on an essential skill. Is it really okay to not have reading recovery when we have $14 million in the savings account? Why is it okay to have $14 million in the spendable savings account when, I, when our kindergarten and first grade teachers still do not have parapros? If you think that's okay, you haven't been in a kindergarten classroom lately. Those little th four and five year olds deserve someone who can help listen and work with them. A one, a, one teacher in the classroom, it isn't happening, not to the degree that it should. Is it really okay to not have parapros when we have $14 million in our savings account? Why is it okay to have $14 million in our spendable savings account when counselors have not been replaced at all levels? At the elementary level, the teachers are now the counselors, and if you think they're doing a good job at it, you're wrong. They're trying, they're doing their best, but some of these little people really need someone to share their deepest fears with and know that someone is looking out for them. Is it really okay to have, not to have counselors when we have $14 million in our savings account? Why is it okay to have $14 million in our savings account when librarians don't exist at the schools anymore? Isn't it our job to get kids to read? Isn't that what a librarian does? Research shows that kids who read are more successful at every level. Why wouldn't we want to get back those kinds of specialists in our schools? Is it really okay to, have, to not have librarians when we have $14 million in our savings account? Why is it okay to have $14 million in our savings account when we have not replaced athletics at the middle school, high school levels, and we're making parents pay for it? As I've said, I know educating is our number one job, but studies show that schools that have athletic teams and extracurricular activities have a higher level of pride showed by students, excel at higher academic levels, and prepare better students, all around students. Is it really okay? to have $14 million in our savings account. Why is it okay to have $14 million in our spendable savings account when MPS is looking to increase class sizes? Experts, or more importantly, these teachers, know that fewer kids in a classroom means better learning opportunities for those children. Is it really okay to raise class sizes when we have $14 million in the savings account? I hoped that when MPS started to recover, that some of these programs and cuts would be replaced. It was part of what made Midland Public Schools exceptional. When I see the budget the administration shared with the public a month ago, I was tremendously disappointed. Having $14 million in the spendable savings account when students are not, today are not receiving the programs they deserve breaks my heart. Why don't these kids deserve what we gave students five or ten years ago? when we have $14 million in the savings account? Is it right that students of parents who are paying taxes today don't get the services, programs, and the best teachers that kids in the future may get? I again hoped that when Midland Public Schools started to recover, they would show their appreciation to the teachers and staff who sacrificed so much during these difficult times. Instead, almost $3 million went into a savings account and half a million was spent on new buses. Again, 
I just want to know, when did Midland Public Schools becoming a, become a banking institution instead of a school system? I think we need to put students first today. We need to start rebuilding what was taken away with the $14 million that is sitting in our savings account. I love my job. I love teaching. With your guidance, insight, and resources, I hope that you can lead this transition so that M Midland Public Schools will once again, again be that amazingly incredible place to work and learn. Thank you. My name is Garrett Turner, and I reside at 913 Airfield Lane. I teach mathematics at Dow High. I'm not here to tell you the ways the administration's current proposal will affect myself and my family. I'm simply here to discuss the logic that increased duties mean increased pay. That practice has been accepted by both the board and administration in regards to administrators' pay, and I want to explain the implications of this practice. As a math teacher at Dow High, I believe I'm qualified uh, to explain some concerns I have with this logic. 62% of administrators have had increases in their income from last school year to this current one. Of those administrators, the average increase has been 2.63%. This news came as a shock to myself, as all teachers in the district have taken a pay freeze from last year, forfeited their pay schedule increases, and been unable to receive increases based on continuing education. It was said that these administrators did not receive a raise. The only explanations that we were told for these increases was that the administrators were getting increased pay for extra duties in their jobs. I am happy for all the administrators who have received extra pay during the school year, and I believe the extra compensation for more work is a very fair thing. However, as a math teacher, I know that the laws of logic state that if extra duties mean more pay, it must also be true that a decrease in pay means that there will be a decrease in duties. If you choose to disagree with this logic, then all mathematics textbooks need to be rewritten. <laughs> While more than half of the administration has received an increase in pay for their extra work, they are asking the teachers to give numerous concessions in their salary. However, there is no reduction in our workload that has been discussed. In fact, there are many teachers who also have received increased duties over the past few years. For example, dealing with issues with students who would normally be able to go to a counselor, increased class sizes, international baccalaureate classes, working on scheduling of next year's classes, working on scheduling problems of current classes. At the last board meeting, we heard from Ms. Martinez, the counselor who works both Central and Northeast and has 1,100 students on her caseload. I'm sure she has received increased duties in the past few years. How is she supposed to take the logic that for administration, more duties means more pay, but for teachers, we are in dire times that require drastic cuts? All I'm asking is that the board and administration just follow the logic that they have already begun to use. If extra duties has meant more pay for the administration, it must follow that less pay means less duties. If it really, is it really necessary to reduce our pay, um, then we should re be receiving less on our plate. If times are truly so dire, then our administrators should not have received pay increases while we are being asked to take a cut of any kind. I'm Terry Schwarzkopf and I work at Dow High as a mathematics teacher and a boys varsity tennis coach. The Lord has blessed my life. He provided me a solid foundation and a wonderful upbringing, teaching me how to reach for my goals while maintaining ethical and moral standards. I graduated valedictorian from St. John's Public High School, received a full ride scholarship for academics to Central Michigan University, graduated summa cum laude with a 3.99, earned a master's of administration degree from SVSU with a 4. Point. I've spent 12 years in the classroom, 
Twice I've been voted to represent the senior class at Dow High. I've coached multiple state championship tennis teams. My life has been successful. And I share this for the following reason. I did not go into education to get rich. My father, a superintendent, attempted to talk me out of it. Yet I chose education. I chose it because I felt I could impact the lives of children in a world where they are bombarded with monumental decisions on a daily basis. I chose it because I believed that I could make the subject of math more understandable. I chose it because I needed to make a difference. I sought out Midland Public Schools because it was the best. The triumvirate of parents, teachers, and administration was united and focused on what was best for our children. Ultimately, I'm concerned that the school board has lost that vision. We could blame the economy. We could blame our governor. I mean, it's obvious he has a personal vendetta toward public education. Yet, that, <laughs> but that does not truly identify the scope of change that I've witnessed in my decade at Dow. There is now a palpable attitude and defiance between our two groups, and, and I fear that this actually strengthens the governor's resolve. Having been to previous board meetings, I've seen members of this board react to our concerns in, in mocking, hostile, bored, condescending manners. It, it appears that you're indifferent to our thoughts and concerns, and, and I pray I'm reading your body language incorrectly, and that our concerns for our schools and our students are not ignored. One of those concerns I have as a business math teacher is the gross miscalculation in school finances on an annual basis. I understand that the state changes funding. What I fail to understand is how we can justify discrepancies of four million dollars average on projections over the last three years. Last year, the district added 1.9 million to our nonprofit bank account due to miscalculation, and yet there's a cry of crisis. We threaten busing as a possible cut, but we buy seven new vehicles. And we did not choose to buy the buses when we had a surplus of 1.9 million, but instead we purchased the buses months later so we could claim we're spending down our fund balance. With a degree in administration, I can't decide if that's brilliant or devious. <laughs> Furthermore, students and parents now pay for the opportunity of athletic participation, but these fees do not support their chosen sport, they're placed into the general fund as well. Meanwhile, athletic budgets continue to be slashed. It is clearly not the same state of cooperation that it was when I came a decade ago. Moreover, that's evidence when the district compares MPS to others. When comparing scores and achievements, we are compared to the gross points in Birmingham schools because they're the best. But when we compare compensation, we magically change whom we're comparable with, and we go with local districts. As a board, it seems you don't want to acknowledge the tie between compensation and test scores, even though it's been shown through multiple studies. And though logically fallible, we validate comparing apples to oranges instead of maintaining consistencies. But what is most upsetting to me is that the school board continues to advocate for the increase of class size and the removal of programs in an effort to enlarge the fund balance and increase administrative compensation. And I understand the claim that administration has not received raises, but compensation for added duties. According to the information that we received from Linda Klein, administrative staff salaries at the superintendency level have increased 18.65% and school administration has increased 0.91% during this time of crisis. If the situation is as dire as you claim, how is that justified? And if you can justify these actions, then as teachers, we constantly have added duties shifted to us through the removal of counselors, the cutting of programs, desired increase in class size, and increased expectations of the district. Yet our compensation for added duties is a desired double-digit cut to our salary. Again, I'm only asking for you to maintain consistency. If these cuts are imposed, one choice I must seriously contemplate is seeking secondary employment at the collegiate level. However, if this occurs, I'm heartbroken to think that I will no longer have the necessary time to devote to the tennis program at Dow High. After five years and three state championships, there's a high probability that I would need to resign in order to meet my financial responsibilities. And though this would break my heart as I have devoted myself to the program players, families, and schools, I may have no other option. In conclusion, I know my time is up. I barely recognize the district in which I work anymore. I wanted to make a difference for kids. Thus far, I think I'm succeeding. And fear not, I'm not gonna abandon my duties. I'll continue to provide my students the best educational experience I can. But I am thankful that I had my father to watch growing up. 
because he showed me how administrators can work justly with teachers. It may be all I have, but it gives me hope that someday we can bring that philosophy back to the forefront of MBS. My name Renee, is Renee Baker, and I represent this great group of employees, the Midland City Education Association, and I'm very proud to represent them. <laughs> Their leadership has asked me to come to speak to you tonight. I see that you have on your agenda tonight a discussion for the fact-finding report. And before you do that presentation on that topic, I want to remind you of the facts as they appear in that fact finder's report. You have also a summary in front of you. Fact number one, class size. While the teachers have held firmly that class size should not be increased at all, the fact finder recommended only that sixth grade classes should be raised by stu two students, not across the grade levels. This is much more in line with the teacher's table position. Fact number two, health insurance premium share. The fact finder's recommendation was to use the teacher's premium sharing plan of 3% of salary for full family coverage, 2.5% of salary for two-person coverage, and 1.75% of salary for single subscribers. Since fact finding, this board chose district-wide to go with the hard cap plan, which would not require any of your Midland Public School employees to pay towards their health insurance premium to date. However, the teachers have continued at the table to offer to pay towards their health insurance premiums. To date, even more than the amount that w was determined by the fact finder is fair. Fact number three salary concessions. The fact finder recommended a mix of both permanent concessions and temporary concessions, such as unpaid furlough days, again in line with the teacher's table proposals. The teachers have offered temporary concessions through unpaid furlough days and permanent concession increases through a formula using revenue. While the fact finder does not recommend a specific formula, her recommendations and advice on a formula are very close to the teacher's table position of December, and even closer to the teacher's current table position to date for a mix of both temporary and permanent concessions. Fact number four, general fund surplus balance. The fact finder, in reference to the general fund surplus balance, made the comment that it is reasonable and prudent for the district to aim to maintain 15% general fund balance. Aim to uh, maintain. She also noted in previous documentation in that fact finding report that the district was at 17.9% of operating expend expenditures at the beginning of this current year. A dollar amount well above the reasonable and prudent 15% that she made reference to in her decision. The teacher's table position, we believe, will be enough to do our part in keeping the district's general fund surplus balance above the 15% amount by making our fair share of sacrifices. In general, Ms. Opperwall believes her recommendation constitutes a significant change for the district and that with her recommendation of teachers absorbing health coverage cost in the vicinity of 3% of compensation, 2% reduction on the wage scale, 1% reduction off the wage scale, and a variety of other reductions that this is apparently the teacher's fair share of sacrifice to make. We must remember that the teachers are only approximately 60% of the total budget expenditures. The teachers cannot be expected to all by themselves save this district from all the financial difficulties that it experiences as the legislators assault the district's budget. The teachers did not create the problems that Midland Public Schools are facing.
put the blame where it, that mostly lies, with our state legislators, who continue to erode away the fine funding of our public school systems across the state of Michigan. By buying into the legislator's rhetoric to go after teachers and other public school employees' salaries, and benefits. This board is doing just what the state legislators want all of us to do. Get distracted with the wrong things so the legislators can continue to ram their anti-worker, anti-public school, anti-middle class agenda down the throats of the citizens of this state with little notice. Let's use our energies to fight the real fight. That is the one in Lansing. There should be no fight here in this local school district. We are all on the same side, that of our students and our community. Use the fact finder's recommendation, get a fair and equitable contract settled as soon as possible for your employees, for this district, for your students, and for this community. Thank you. My name is Bridget Sova, and I reside at 5011 Bristlecone Drive, um, and I teach at Northeast Middle School. I'd like to begin with some thank yous. I'd like to thank Yvonne Gorton for the support she showed by visiting Northeast in the aftermath of the arson fire that we had. I appreciate the time she took to meet with staff that were impacted by the senseless crime. In addition to Yvonne, there are many others that deserve a big thank you, and that would include Jeff Jaster and Lori Pritchard, our building principals, <laughs> Tammy, Sue, Nancy, who are our office staff, Kathy Spalding, for her efforts in arriving early in reporting the fire. by Colin, whose support on seven occasions she came to the building to visit with us. <laughs> Countless teachers at Northeast and around our whole district who stepped right up to help out with collecting necessary books, materials, parents who emailed, phoned, and sent materials as well, Walmart who contacted Northeast wanting to help out, and lastly, the flexibility and kindness that our students at Northeast have shown. I also came here to discuss our contract issues. I'm here this evening to share with you my concern about teaching without a contract after nearly two years. Up to this point, I've remained in the shadow of my union, not sure if all that I heard was exactly accurate. I figured that the truth lies somewhere between the district's point of view and my union's. I anxiously awaited the report from the Merck fact finder, Kathleen Operwall, to hear an alternate opinion one that would have all the facts of both sides then be able to decipher them without influence. Upon receiving the report, my first reaction was relief. Relief that a union I have paid into for close to 20 years is being as honest and forthright as I would hope them to be. A union that presented the facts to me in a non-skewed manner and has stood firm on topics that I feel strongly about, such as class size. On the flip side, what is it with our district claiming doom and gloom, and then adding millions to our fund surplus? Why is it that our district feels the need to gouge the pockets of its teachers? Do they not see what we're doing? Do they not see that due to our high level of expectations and dedication in the classroom, we are producing some of the finest students in the state? Why is it? Why is it that our district feels the necessity to take on upwards of 12% of its teacher's salaries when the Mac, Firk find, Mac fact finder, Kathleen Morfwall, clearly stated that our district is not in dire circumstances and that it should not need to be reduced more than 2%? My union has come to the table on several occasions willing and able to negotiate a fair contract. 
Why is it that the district feels that they have to dig their heels in and go for gold when the only one being hurt is our students and the trust of its own teachers? The truth is in. The district is a whole lot further from where the Mac, Fir find, Mac fact finder Kathleen Oprahwal believes would be a fair and equitable settlement than my union. And I have lost faith in believing that my district is willing to recognize that the core of their gold mine is their teachers. That's the uh, end of those of you who have s signed to speak this evening. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to step forward? Yes, please. My name is Pamela Ponte. I live at 4650 North Hope Road. I'm a paraprofessional. I rather call myself a paraeducator. I have worked with many of these teachers. I have stood beside them. I have also been on the... Um, I've been athletic, assistant athletic director for Dow High for almost 13 years. I've been a parapro for 14 and a half years. I know what every one of these teachers do every day, and I stand behind them. I'm a parapro of 14 years. I make $11 an hour. I have not had a raise in over six years. But I stand behind these teachers, and I stand beside our students. And I think it's really sad when I have to go home at night just recently and pray to God that a child at our middle school does not commit suicide because there's not a counselor there to help that child. I have also, also had to put my arms around a young man who was abused the night before by his parents. There wasn't a counselor there that had time to talk because they were someplace else. Please. Allow us to continue to wing our job, and please support the parapros of this community that work for pennies above minimum wage to continue to support these students and give a loving, t kind, tender heart. My husband is retired Captain Midland Police, Silly Police Department. He also works for Midland County Jail, and we all know that these students, if they do not have the counseling, if they do not have the support of these teachers, that they're all going to be on the street and they're not getting the education we need. But I will stand at $11 an hour, and I will continue to support those kids, and I will put that arm around them and give them a hug every day and tell them I love them. Please don't do this to our community. Thank you. I'm a new teacher here at Men, and I teach in German at, at two of your schools. Um, when I applied for this job, I, I looked at the product. I looked and I saw that this uh, school district was in the top 10% in the state. I said, that's where I want to teach. I want to teach where teachers care. I want to teach where, where the program is run correctly. Um, my father-in-law has always told me, uh, when you run a business, you don't, you don't make your profit on the backs of your employees. And uh, if, I, if I use a business analogy, you're making a profit here. I mean, it's obvious. I'm, I'm, I'm new, but you've been adding to your, to your savings account on a regular basis. That means you're making a profit. Secondly, uh, you're, you're putting out a good product. You know, you can't be in the top 10% of, of the state unless you're doing a good job to this point in time. And so I would say, you know, why would you then cut your employees who are producing the good product and giving you a profit even now as it stands and, and ask them to do more for less? It doesn't make sense. It's like uh, it's a bad business decision. Just personally, as I look at it, I came here, so I have no I have no real ties to Midland like a 20-year teacher. I can, I can exit the scene just as quickly as I came. And <laughs> I'm just being frank. And, and for me, uh, I thought, you know, I'm a first-year teacher. I expect to start at a lower salary. But I didn't expect that uh, coming in the second year, I'd be looking at a reduction. And frankly, if I have to do, if I have to do that, 
I'm a talented teacher. I'm good at what I do. And uh, there's other places to teach who want to support their teachers. Back. Anyone else? Okay, we'll close the point of or the period of time to address the board and move on to our agenda. And then we'll start with uh, analysis of the fact finder by Mr. Ellinger and Mr. Valenti. You know, just about the time. Okay, I would I would only ask that we um, we shared or you shared your points with us. We'd ask the same respect to those who speak now, please. I would just encourage as many of you to stay uh, to stay as you can because I think um, some of this board's and the administration's interpretation of the fact finders report will give you some other points that you haven't heard up to this point that you might want to consider and reflect on. You know, I think sometimes we get into situations like this and, and we all feel we have to decide who's right and it comes at the expense of another side being wrong. And I think we heard some eloquent um, appeals to the Board of Education tonight saying there has to be a different way to get through this. I spend a good share of my days um, and my nights, to tell you the truth, last night being one of them, awake between 2 in the morning and 4.30 thinking that as, response, that as superintendent, I have a large responsibility for helping lead this district through where we find ourselves right now. And I see a tremendous amount of stress around the district. I see it developing in our community, and I worry that I see it in our kids, the kids that we all have a common interest in, in serving. Even the fact finders report addresses where some of that stress comes from. She addresses that in seven years, there's been a reduction in revenue of $12 million in this district. That is huge when you look at a budget uh, in the 82 to 84% range. And before I came here, I worked for a district that was not one of the favored and wealthy 20J districts. And I always thought how nice it would be to come to a district and, and work under a situation like that. I didn't dream that once I got here, after being here one year, the state would begin talking about taking two and a half million dollars away from us, which we'll have done now for three years in a row. That's part, that seven and a half million dollars is part of that twelve and a half that the fact finder says we're down. And there's no way to look at our fund equity and say that we can continue to, to continue the financial cost of the operations without addressing that. And that's not news to anyone here in this room. This board knew this well before I joined the board for seven years now. Need I remind all of us what the sacrifices are that a lot of you have made in the community, but not just you, other employee groups. Our building managers just this past year sacrificed 7% of their income for this current school year to play their part in helping the district address the financial challenge that faces us. There have been other employee groups that for two years in a row, we're very close to closing out this year, next year being the third year, that have made contributions out of their paycheck of between 2 and 3% already. You know about all the cuts we've made. You know that we've looked at privatizing transportation. We've looked at contracting for transportation. We've done the analysis on that. We are so lean already in our transportation operations that we're not going to save much money, certainly not worth the effort to go down that path at this point in time. We continue to purchase buses, and just in case there's someone here that doesn't understand the reason we have to do that, it's because all of us, frankly, and a lot of you here in this room, do not want students transported on buses that are not safe. And we went through a three-year period where the board didn't purchase any buses whatsoever. That put us behind from 18 to 24 bus purchases, and that put us in a very precarious position with some of the buses that we were using. And let's not forget that the enhancement millage that passed three years ago was passed with a very specific purpose. We were not to use that money to benefit compensation packages or to pay for health insurance 
but to spend that on technology, to try and maintain class size, to support transportation costs in and and technology, and I can tell you that's what we've used that money on. So we find ourselves in a very strange um, situation, given the, the, the long and rich and um, excellent history that Midland Public Schools has and, and frankly trying to meet the expectations that our community has for each and every one of us, including this board um, here in this room. I want to clarify something for you that we just clarified with some of our board members here recently, and that is I want to review the financial audit with just one term, and that is what happened with the fund equity. We hear that we're putting three and four million dollars away in fund equity, and I need to tell you that that is just not true. And if you are under that impression, you are being misinformed, because we get this information audited every year, and people can, can be prosecuted if they misrepresent that to our auditors, and that's never happened, and it never will, I don't believe, here at Midland Public Schools. If you go back to the end of the 2006-2007 the school year, there was a budget surplus of $156,144. That's how much we ended the budget by not having to get into fund equity. In fact, we increased it by that amount of money. If you look at the year, the next year, 2007-2008, we got into the fund equity, the so-called savings account, for $3,589,526. $3,589,526. The vast majority of that was to pay off the tax appeal for the utility company here, MCV. I think most of us are aware of that. The following year in 2008, 2009, we had a deficit budget on our hands, but it was like breaking even. We were $14,220 beyond what we thought expenses were going to be that year. So I've just reviewed three of the last five years, and I don't see millions of dollars being added to the fund equity. We get to the year 2009-2010. The operating surplus that year wasn't a surplus. It was a deficit of a little less than a half million dollars, 484743 And then we get to the year that everybody likes to talk about which is last year, 2010-2011. And yes, there was a contribution made back to the fund equity at the end of that year of $2,338,543. And I hear even in the characterization of the very emotional and very passionate appeal that a number of you have made that we're somehow out of the woods and that we should start restoring programming and we can get back to the days when we can all live with the budget as if we still had 12 million that we no longer have. Of that contribution to the fund equity last year, two million of that was one-time revenue. For the most part, it was edgy dollars and era carryover dollars. That's not gonna come back. And if we try to use that for ongoing expenses, we're going to dig a hole for ourselves very, very quickly here. If you project out, and we're going to get into some detail of this in a PowerPoint presentation, what the fact finder has recommended, there is one flaw, frankly, in the fact finder's finding. And it's not really her fault. We ask her to look at the term of the contract that we're trying to negotiate. And right now, that's for this year and for the 12-13 school year. The 10, 11 years is over. When we started talking about the contract, we started talking about a three-year contract. I find it very interesting that what the fact finder has on the table, in terms of what you've heard characterized by Ms. Baker tonight, and this may be a surprise to a number of you here in the room, is exactly almost to the percentage point, the tenth of a percent, what this Board of Education had on the table two years ago when we started negotiating. And that offer was turned down by the MCEA. That may be, may be news to some of you here in the room today. If we project out, and this is the year that the, the fact finder has, she looked at the budget for the next 15 months through June 30th, 2013. And I guess if these seven board members feel that it's in the community's best interest to only look out into the future for 15 months and plan what 
they and perhaps you would find more acceptable as a financially stable school district, that is an option that's before them. I will do what they direct me to do, but I can't give them that advice. Because if you look beyond June of 2013, and we're going to be more than fair as we take a view of that this evening, we're going to assume that we don't spend 100% of the budget this year or next year. Typically, we try to bring the budget in 2% underneath what we think expenditures are going to be. But we're going to work so, I think, so hard to help people understand that what if we brought the budget in at only 96% of what we thought expenditures were going to be? And it will still drastically reduce the fund equity that you're hearing is 17% or about $14.5 million. We all have to get used as a district that we will never be able to go back and operate the way that we have been. And I don't think there's any person up here at this table that would deny they would love to restore a lot of the programs that we've cut. They would love to be able to continue to pay people what they've earned um, in the past. But I don't think that's going to happen. And at the end of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, I'll talk to you exactly about what's happened between administrators because we've heard references here to administrators getting raises in a year when teachers don't. And I'll address that in, in just a brief two or three slides. So let's start the PowerPoint presentation. Before I do that, I hope you understand that um, I think all of us, administration and the board, would be embarrassed if we felt our job was becoming anything remotely related to a financial institution or a bank. And that for some reason we were just putting the money away because we felt that it was something that we needed to do. There is a rationale that drives that thinking. And when you look at where our costs that were associated when we had $12 million could lead us, we used to think that those times were four or five years out into the future. And you're going to see some data now that's going to show you that those times are, could be as recently as just one or two years away. And it'll be sobering information, I think. I won't dispute what Ms. Baker had to say. The issues before the fact finder absolutely had to do with the district's ability to pay, but she didn't define what ability to pay was. But she recognized there were some large structural costs and that the board should be very careful with what they, uh, they agreed to. We addressed salaries. We addressed the insurance as stated in class size. Um, as I mentioned before, both sides agreed to submit proposals for a three-year contract period, but obviously we're narrowing in on one particular year now. The fact finder, however, did not consider the effect of her recommendations and what they might have on years beyond the expiration of the contract, which means beyond June of 2013. And we're going to show some information tonight that will clarify that. She also stated that all Michigan school districts have been negatively impacted by reduced state funding over the last several years. Some districts like Midland have been more seriously impacted than average. And there's the page citation for it. And she recognized that at the high point for the 0809 school year, the per pupil funding allowance was $8,904. But by the 11-12 school year, that had been reduced to an effective foundation allowance of just $8,141. These are direct quotes from her. She also recognized the district has taken many steps to reduce its expenditures. The savings has, however, been more than offset by the dramatic increase in the pension contribution rate that the district has to pay into the Michigan Public School Retirement System. That's a huge issue that's out there for every school district in the state of Michigan with projections that it could get into the 30% range. She also mentioned that it was undisputed that the district is experiencing a significant drop in revenue for the 11-12 school year. And that it is reasonable and prudent for the district to aim to maintain a 15% general fund balance. I think even the MCEA president was quoted in the Sagadaw News if it was an accurate quote of agreeing that we should have a 15% fund equity. I had never heard that uh, from our local union before that they thought that was acceptable. So I'm glad to see that. The problem with this, however, is that that's going to get cut in half very, very quickly if this board is not prudent with how it manages the district. And the long-term best interest, if you consider two or three years long-term, on behalf of this community. 
Overall, the fact finder says the district has a reduced ability to pay compared with past years. The district is not in dire circumstances. It does need to reduce its expenses in keeping with its reduced revenue, but she sidestepped the question on showing where those reduced expenses should come from. But she recognizes that we have to continue reducing expenses. Her recommendations include reducing salaries by 2% on the salary schedule going forward. Does that mean that that's permanent? We think so. I think even the MCEA thinks so, but we will uh, decide when we get close to a settlement. For the remainder of the 11-12 year, um, apply one unpaid furlough day. That will save the district about $240,000 and is generally considered about a half a step or a half a percent. For the 11, for the 2012-13 year, she, she suggests applying two unpaid furlough days, but she doesn't suggest that those furloughs day, furlough days necessarily become permanent and therefore a reduction of our structural ongoing costs. She suggests that we apply, apply the other compensation reductions with the, which the parties have agreed to, but we do not delay step increases by a semester. Delaying step increases would primarily impact our lower paid staff members who have been here 14, year, 14 years or less. Most of us here in this room uh, realize that. She also recommends that it's reasonable to ask the bargaining unit members to absorb about a 3.6% decrease in their total compensation at this time, consistent with the decrease which the district has experienced in its per pupil revenue. The additional revenue losses due to declining student count need to continue to be handled through further downsizing of the district. Noteworthy that she does not suggest on how we do that, but she recognizes that we need to rather than from a larger reduction in compensation. If the fact finder were here this evening, I would ask her where she thinks the examples are in this district of what we could downsize that we haven't already. What's left? Transportation, athletics, those will come with a cost um, if, it, if it comes to that. The association's salary proposal did not ad ad adequately recognize the reduction in per, per, per pupil revenue, which the district has already experienced. That's a quote from the fact finder. She also says that the district's salary proposal didn't adequately recognize that ongoing reductions in staffing can continue to achieve some of the needed reductions in expenditures. She talks about health coverage, saying adopting the association's proposal of the shared percentages you see there, one and three quarters, two and a half and three percent, with the understanding that if the district needs to require 20 percent cost sharing, that the percentages will increase as necessary to meet this requirement. Want to remember what she's doing in making that statement? Statement is tipping to all of us that the contributions that we may make in this particular contract for health care may not be all it needs to be in the future. It assumes that other agreed upon modifications of medical coverage would result in an additional savings of about 280,000 per year. And page 12 nets out the medical savings against the increase in the MIPSERS cost, so it's not really 280, it's $140,000 of net saving. She does recognize um, that and recommend that we increase the maximum by two pupils, but only for sixth grade not recognizing what administration had put forth. And she's not recommending a specific formula for the parties to use in future years, although they could use the same general approach, such as focusing on the increase or decrease in per pupil revenue and adjusting total bargaining unit compensation and benefits up or down consistent with that. I think a formula is currently being discussed in negotiations. I can't say very much about that. I don't think Ms. Baker or Ms. Collins will either, but I think both sides are hopeful that that may produce some place to find a compromise here. But what, un what unanswered questions are there out there from the fact finder's report? Did the fact finder intend for her recommendations to be fully implemented in this current school year or what's left of it? There aren't that many paychecks to be drawn yet out of this school year. Or does only the furlough day apply? That's significant for you to keep in mind before we look at the financial sheets that follow this. 
because the answer to this question can change the percent of the fund balance that remains on June 30th by as much as three percentage points. That's a lot of money if you look at us having an $84 million budget. Every 1% of that would be $820,000 to $840,000. I know this is a little difficult to read, and I apologize if people from home cannot read this. We'll have this PowerPoint up on our website um, tomorrow morning, I believe. But what I want to point out to you is uh, important for you to understand here. And that is the effect on the fund balance of the recommendations if the reductions were effective, not this year, but with the next school year, 2012-2013. And the financial numbers that we're showing you here come from the amended budget that the board adopted back on February 13, 2012 from our budget projections for the board. If you look in the top right hand, and the way this is divided up is you'll read in the first square um, under the title, June 30th, 2011, the available, the available fund balance. What is ava available for spending after excluding for non-spendable and restricted items? That means money that we've received from foundations for the IB program, for technology, for what we have to put away to cover our self-funded insurance. It means we have about $13.5 million dollars as a cushion, what most of us would consider in our home as our savings account. What you see in the top right hand corner, well let's drop down to the next box then. Because this is the operating deficit for the current 11-12 school year. You'll see that the savings from the fact finder is, we think, and I'm not certain what the MEA thinks about, the MCEA thinks about that, but we believe that the fact finder is saying that for this school year, one option is to just take a furlough day, which would save the district $240,000. That would mean that the operating deficit for this year, having to come out of that $13.5 million, would be $4.3 million. That's a burn rate that's pretty fast if we can't get our larger structural costs under control. What I mean by that are ongoing costs. To be very fair, though, what you see under the no budget variance means that we would spend 100% of what we thought we were going to spend when the board adopted this budget or when they amended it back in, in February. And the history has been here for a long time that we shoot to only spend 98% of what we think the expenses are going to be. And that allows us to bring the budget in under budget at the end of the year, typically. But to be very fair for this presentation, we said, let's take a look for the 11-12 school year, and this is what you see up on the top right-hand corner. For 11-12, what if we only spent 98% of the budget and we didn't spend 100% of it? Then the board would be reaching into its savings account for $2.6 million, and it would drop the fund equity, audited fund equity for last June, down to 13.4 or 10.9%. Uh, if you look at the last box on the bottom, underneath the last line that goes across, it's the projected 2012-2013 operating deficit. That deficit, as it looks right now, if we were to spend 100% of the money this year, and we would plan on only spending 96% of our planned expenditures for next year, which is more than fair. This board has never really looked at budgets this way until I got here. This is more than fair to take a look um, at that. Some people would say that's too rosy of a picture, it's too optimistic. It is certainly the best case scenario. It has us going into the 12-13 year showing an $8.2 million deficit budget, which if we spent 100% of the money would drop that fund equity virtually down to nothing after one more school year. But if you look at the best case scenario where we would only spend 96% of what we think next year's expenses are going to be, it will cut that fund equity in half, by more than half, in one year. And if you've done that in one year, you can see what that leads to in the following year. So what kind of a slope line does this leave for how the district continues to operate itself? You have a negative slope line across the middle of this bar graph. You can see that's the zero line. Ideally, that's where we'd like to be. I will sometimes hear from employees administrators, teachers, um, paras, others, they'll say, if you could just let us have, Mr. Ellinger, if the board could just let us have what we have and not ask us to take a, a, a concession or a decrease, we could live with that. 
The problem is the school district can't. And you see that slope line and a burn rate that um, is not very positive, especially when you look at it for this current school year and what it could be next year. So let's take a look at what the effect of the fact finder's recommendations would be if we implemented some of that with what's left out of the current school year. What that would mean is that there would be, um, we'd start out with the same 16.3% fund equity. The operating deficit would be 4.5 million. The revised projected operating deficit, if we took the fact finder's recommendation and we started implementing them yet this year, would leave us with a 13.8% fund equity. And then if you go into the 12-13 uh, year and we only spend again 96% of the budget, which would be wildly optimistic, we could actually have a fund equity that went up to 16.5%. If you look in the very bottom box, 2012-13, you see an operating deficit of 11 million. You see the 2.9 million, that would be what the fact finder recommended for this year. That would drop our fund equity um, down at June of 2013 to just 4%. Best case scenario, if we only spent 96%, we'd be at 10.4% um, at the end of the next school year, dropping from 163 What does the slope line look like? It's still not where it needs to be to keep the district upright and to have a budget where we only spend on an annual basis something equal to what we bring in, but it's a far improvement over what the uh, previous graph would look like. But that would require huge sacrifice in order to get some of those savings out of the remaining pay that the MCEA has for this school year. So there will do definitely be, be pain associated with this. It's just a matter of when do we want to experience it and over what period of time. So the outcome of the recommendations is inconsistent, frankly, with the statement that the board should maintain a 15% fund balance. Administratively, we can't figure out why the fact finder would say, yes, 15% is a reasonable fund equity, but she didn't cost out what her proposal would do to that fund equity because those two figures are incongruent with each other. So the recommendations seem to treat what should have been a three-year contract as a single year. That's a problem for all of us here in this room. They ignore the revenue decreases and compensation increases of prior years. They use estimated 11-12 compensation costs as the baseline for estimating the necessary reductions. And the recommendations rely on a definition of per pupil revenue that includes funds that aren't available for general operations. She looks at a, what she calls a 17.9% fund equity, assuming that that all can be used for operational cost in the district, and it can't be. Only 14.5 million of that can. And we have to keep about a million to a million two to cover our health care costs that we pay on a, a weekly basis. So there's some incongruence in what the fact finder has recommended here. So in summary, the fact finder's report has created a good framework for continued negotiations, but its apparent focus on a single year solution doesn't adequately address the financial issues that face the district. Negotiations continue with the aid of a mediator. I understand the last time they met, um, actually, things went pretty well, uh, but they've decided not to meet. Both sides have decided not to meet for three weeks, but they intend to meet three times in the last two weeks of April. Uh, there's a lot of homework that's coming back to the table, and it would appear that maybe some progress is being made there, although I don't sit at the table, and I can't sit here and tell you that for sure. With that, I would open that up to our Board of Education for any questions that you might have. Realizing that I'm not your financial expert, she could not be here this evening. Carl, okay. Carl I have a question and or concern. Um, when I look at the best case situation, which I think is that slide, uh, whoops, go right there, where we spend less than budget next year, that the reductions that the, con that the fact finder talks about are applied in both the rest of this year, although it would be very short, and next year, that we end up with a 10.4 fund equity at the end of next year, which would be the end of the 
contract that we're talking about. Is that correct? Based, the fact finder gave us feedback contingent upon the contract years ending at the end of the 12, 13 year. That's correct. That's cr okay, so that 10.4, and so at that point on, it would take another contract and another negotiation from that point on to address the negative $5 million, $4.8 million, call it $5 million deficit that's looking in that second year. That's true. So if we were just to roll over the pay and benefit schedule into the next year, you would be likely, because we'll have less students and less revenue, but we'll, to her point, may be able to trim those proportionately in terms of our costs. Maybe so, maybe no. We could be looking at another $5 million short, call it $4 million short, that following year, and I know I'm just projecting and not necessarily true, and that would take us to nothing at the end of 13 and 14, with the same negative continuing for the next year. You would be looking at a 4.878 um, uh, deficit budget essentially two years in a row if you, if you try to move it all in to next year. Yeah. And I know this sounds so confusing to some of you sitting here in the room and who don't deal with these numbers. Um, and there's not an easy way to explain that other than to recognize that we're still trying to live with expenses as if we had the 20J money and as if we had the, uh, um, the 12 million that we used to have seven years ago. And we have cut about every available program and staff um, you know what, I wouldn't even sit here in front of all of you as teachers, knowing the hard work that you do. You know, I used to be a teacher. I know what the impact is of not having counseling and not having the kind of intervention programs that we have. Um, I'm not even sure that making all those reductions was the smartest thing for us to do as a district. But I know that in the absence of significant, in the absence of significant, a significant new reality on how we compensate our employees here. Um, we are riding a train that's taken us someplace that none of us in this community want to go. So why did you give the administrator so raises? I'm going to come back and, and talk about this. This is a discussion for the board now. Any other questions? There's a, a, a Carl and his Rick? No, I'm Y'all yeah, set? And, and yeah. Carl, I think you made the yeah. point, but in my eight years on the board, it's very clear that these days of reckoning always seem to be four years out, five years out, so let's start trimming now when we started making decisions. But this is starting to get to be two years out. <laughs> um, I'm going to answer this question once and for all about... Um, how we have um, compensated our administrators here, but I can't do that unless I also talk about how we compensate teachers. And it is a little bit ironic, if I'm completely truthful with you, um, that until the state changed the law that said in, in the face of an unsettled contract, <coughs> teachers can't automatically roll over to their next step that it's rather convenient for our union now to say teachers didn't get raises, but administrators did. When up until this year, we always heard from our teachers union that even when you got steps, that wasn't considered a raise. So I'm more than willing to address this issue of administrative um, raises. But it's important for you to, in this room and for our community to understand that up until this year, we have 14 steps on our salary schedule that teachers are on. Meaning that if your education level is the same and it hasn't changed from one year to another, and you're making, let me just say $30,000 in your fourth year of teaching, and we know that's way low. If you move to your fifth year of teaching, you get a step, and on that steps, based on where your education is, for 40% of our teachers this year, once we settle this contract, you will get a prorated amount, but you'll get your entire step in another year. 
And depending on where you are on that salary schedule, that is a 2.5 to a 7.5% increase. And never before have teachers publicly stated that they consider that a raise. They consider that an entitlement. Now, why did I share that? Because in how Midland Public Schools works, the Board of Education Policy Manual, it says all staff members' salaries will be established within the range for their level. Staff members without experience in a position will be paid at a figure near the bottom of the range. They will receive raises each year within the range on the basis of an annual evaluation. And their raises during the first years they are in a position will be based on several factors including growth through experience in the position and quality of performance. The rate at which an administrator advances yearly within the range from base to maximum depends on an overall rating on the yearly performance evaluation. And these increases are independent of changes to the salary schedule. So much like teachers have historically had, there is a range of salaries that when an administrator steps into that position, they advance to, and like teachers up until this year, that was never considered a raise in the past. And it's in the board manual. Any administrators promoted to a new position would also have received a raise. So technically, when the board adopted the salary letter last June, you did not consider administrators getting a raise unless they got a promotion. And the examples that have been circulated around the district are somewhat misleading because some of those administrators that some of you have seen salary information on weren't in their, their position full time the previous year. So of course that salary schedule is going to show an increase in pay. I'm not sure that that's well understood um, by some of us here in this room. So why did some employee groups see their wage scales reduced by 2.5% in 2011 and 12 when administrators did not? Well, here's the reason why. The goal that we had with the board in adopting this year's budget was to reduce the cost to MPS of each employee group, non-unionized groups, the unaffiliated groups, by 2.5%. And this was accomplished in different ways by different employee groups. For administrators, we eliminated, eliminated their, their mileage and their cell phone stipend, and they increased their medical contribution accomplished by a reduction. Administrators are the only employee group with a second salary schedule that's already 4 to 7 percent lower than the original scale, and for the 11-12 year, more than one-third of administration is on a lower salary schedule than they were the previous year. Market rates for all groups need to be considered. The market group for administrators is not the only other, uh, is not just other school districts, but it's how much you, your, you pay your teachers. If that wasn't a factor in what we pay administrators, we'd never get teachers to come out of the teaching ranks to want to be an administrator because on a daily basis it wouldn't pay you enough to do it. So we have to keep those things in mind. This is a little hard to see, but if you come in from the right of this graph to the left, you will see a copper line that goes up and down. And that copper line is the high end of a teacher's salary here. And what you see on this graph is the certified staff on their annual salary ranges. And the bottom four categories are teacher category 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And you will see that for each of the administrative positions that are on this graph, if you compare that to where that copper line is, there are a number of administrators here that actually are out, uh, have teachers that make more than they do. That's a problem for us to convince some of our best teachers to want to become administrators. So we have to keep that in mind. So if you compare something that's apples to apples, and this is what the board asked us to prepare for you, we took a look at the median salary change for both teachers and administrators, saying that once you identified that line, 50% of the administrators were above it and 50% were below. The exact same thing applies to teachers in this graph. And when you look at this for the four, the five years that I've been superintendent here, this reflects what's happened in terms of compensation for the last four years. Since 2007, 2008 through 10-11, we didn't think it was fair to add 1112 to this, 
because that would have skewed the administrative line because in addition to these reductions here, our administrators that have full family coverage are paying another 3%. But if you look since the 7-8 school year, our teachers have had an increase on average, the median of 1% during that four-year period. Our administrators have had a reduction of, do the math, 1.9 and 1.7 is what, 3.6? This board has a responsibility for taking care of all of its employee groups, and right now this looks on balance um, if you are a building level administrator here in the district. And the only reason for that is because the administrators have been making contributions and they've taken pay freezes for the last two years um, that in all frankness our teachers haven't. And I know our teachers are in a pickle. I mean, when you look at what the board is asking, in terms of their proposal on the table and what authority the board has, that is very difficult for all of you to see as something that could happen to you at one time. But we're really talking about something that could have been spread over three years. And it's unfortunate that we haven't. In fact, there are a number of websites that you can go to that would show prior to the new laws that have been passed that essentially froze teacher steps. There were a number of contract settlements that were settled in this state in the month of July and the first two and three weeks in August before a teacher's first day back to work in August. Because if teachers had a settled contract on the first day, if that was a three-year contract, the new laws wouldn't have applied for three years. So there are a number of ways that we could have approached negotiations, both from the board's point of view and from the MCEA's point of view, and for whatever reason we didn't go down that path. I think some of us wish we would have. That's my presentation to you on the fact finders report and the administrative versus teacher salary comparison. Thank you for questions and comments. Can I refresh my memory? How many years have the administrators and others been paying for the health care contribution? Um, two years? Two years now with anticipation that it'll go into a third year next year. John? The only thing I was going to say is that I, I definitely sense that there's definitely a lot of frustration over the numbers, and there's definitely a need to have some agreement and some unity on the budget. And no matter how good numbers that we can present on each side, I mean, I think we need to develop that confidence. And so I'm, I'm hoping that we're working toward that. I definitely hear the frustration, but I think we've asked a lot of hard questions to say if we're hearing this or hearing this, Carl, to dig into some of the numbers and to help get as good information out there as possible. It doesn't help everybody's feelings right now, but it's really important to try to build some confidence in the numbers because it, it really hasn't been lackluster uh, to, to present. Hopefully that can improve from this point out. I just have one comment, and uh, Renee Baker uh, alluded to this earlier, and that's what's happening in Lansing. And I just want people to know that um, we're not like other districts. We're 20J, and that significantly separates us from about 700 other districts in the state of Michigan and when in the stroke of a pen in the former administration we lost 2.4 million dollars from our budget annually compound that by three years right now and as Carly alluded to earlier that's seven in about, about seven and a half million dollars just attributable to the uh, yes of the 12 million that we've lost in the last several years so we're different, and we don't even have the same formula for, for foundation with respect to our foundation allowance for students. So while you're frustrated with Lansing, you got to sit at this table. You really should sit at this table and, and, fit, and try to figure out what we're going to do with uh, costs that exceed $80 million with revenues that are now under that $80 million and where that money is going to continue to come from. Because once as you all have advocated, we spend that money from our fund balance, our savings account. There is no other place to, nobody's going to come save middle and public. Nobody's going to come save middle and public. Not the state, not the feds, it's going to be us. So the bottom line is, again, if you sense frustration out there with what's going on, you got to sit here. We sense this for the last, I've been on the board going on eight years now. Every year I've been here other than what we see in the academic success and, and the success of our students that we're all here for. 
I have had a sense of frustration every year I've been on this board. So if you're just starting to sense this now, come up here and sense. <laughs> if you're just starting to sense this, and, it, and if you, you know, you can see, you can laugh if you care to. But there's a there's a sense of frustration on this side of the table too, and it's not. It, it, we have no control over it. We have no control over it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Valendi, 5.1, presentation to the board for new staff assignments reduction recall proposed policy. Yes, uh, two board meetings ago I brought to you the uh, board policy that was proposed for new staff assignments reductions and recall. Remember I um, had explained to you that we had worked with Neola who was helping us um, refashion HMSW over the course of the next year. But uh, with their help, um, we recommended a uh, board policy that basically reflects the law. And that's generally NEOLA works from board policies, reflects and cites the law. And um, we put that out for comment for 28 days, and we're bringing it back to you now for action. I have received no comments on it. Have you, Carl? So for action, we would ask that you approve uh, the staff assignments, reductions, and recall proposed board policy. Board's pleasure. So moved. Ms. Barry, Mr. Holy, supported by Dr. Kaminsky. Questions or comments to Mr. Valindi? I, I did have. Go ahead, John. Mr. Valindi, I know, I know what we're developing now, what, you're, what we're uh, having come to the board for action is more or less law, and it's more or less hard language that we have to have. Um, but as this goes on, it's going to. There's other steps, and there's more that's going to be developed with this process. Yes, we'll be bringing you other um, proposals for policy as we work through with Neola uh, that will replace some things that were in contract language, and now we would have in board policies. So there's a clear uh, understanding of how we are going to proceed. That'll be followed also as we work with Neola th through uh, administrative guidelines, etc. <coughs> So you'll be seeing more of the policies, um, but and you'll see um, the full set of policies that Carl will bring to you here, maybe late spring or summer, um, beyond some of the things that are affected by the changes in the law. So there's some development that's <coughs> coming. And we certainly keep our teachers informed as far as what's going on. And, you know, yeah, we had on the, uh, well, I'm going to talk a minute about the uh, evaluation tool, but and none of this is really a surprise because it pretty much uh, mirrors the language of the law just set now or codified in okay. board policy. There's nothing that we <coughs> added or changed to that. Any other questions? If not, we have a motion on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. You have your motion. Okay, we bring you for information for another 28-day examination period a proposed uh, policy on <coughs> the staff evaluation. Again, we worked with Neola through this, and this reflects the mandates of the law. In fact, currently we have an evaluation tool that um, has been uh, fashioned to uh, fit with the law. We're not required to actually have a policy uh, at the board level on this, but in absence of of uh, some of this being in contract language. Um, it, it's advisable that we put it into board policy for clarity, et cetera. Again, you will see a reflection of the language of the law. It asks that uh, employees be evaluated at least annually. Clear approaches to measuring student growth. We've heard about that quite a bit. Using national, state, local assessments and other objective criterion. Uh, the, it used the evaluation to inform decisions about the effectiveness employees for uh, level um, effectiveness rating, promotion, retention, and development of employees, whether to grant tenure or for full certification, and for removing ineffective tenured or untenured employees after they've had ample opportunities to improve. Those were the, the hallmarks of the legislation, and they are reflected, I think, very clearly in this policy. Once again, there are not additions that we are making to what was in the law. It's simply trying to be a clear statement uh, for all employees who will be guided by HSMSW uh, so that, um, uh, that 
they can, we can move forward with this. Staff has had the evaluation tool since the opening me, uh, PD meeting uh, in September, and then we um, solicited comments, suggestions, et cetera. We uh, incorporated a few of those. We had worked prior to the legislation with a committee with the MCA uh, trying to negotiate how we were going to do this, but then with the legislation we couldn't negotiate anymore, but I have shared this with uh, the um, MCA leadership and we have shared this with teachers as far as the evaluation tool and we have taken uh, input on it. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Back to Mr. Ellinger and Mr. Costas for 5.2 in the sinking fund projects. Yeah, this is a uh, request to um, change a previous action by the board when you adopted all the summer 2012 sinking projects. Um, that had totaled uh, one million two thousand eight hundred dollars um, earlier in the school year. Um, after some discussion at our last FFO meeting, there was some discussion in the absence of a sinking fund because our winter tax collection this year uh, ends the sinking fund. Uh, that we should come back and uh, rethink: Would we do any projects whatsoever? We had this discussion at FFO, or would we do some? As a result of that discussion, I'm bringing a recommendation that you modify the previous action and limit the summer projects just to the elementary and ceiling upgrades at Adams Elementary uh, at a cost, the revised cost of $323,182. And one other project which would authorize $20,000 for district concrete replacement just, that just tends to bust up through you know, freezing and thawing and so on that we would typically do every year. Um, I will share with you that that will still leave just in the sinking fund alone, and those dollars can only be used for sinking fund projects. Uh, we anticipate having $1,014,333 left, and then there are additional dollars from PRME, from the sale of property that's in a PRME account that the board could rely on should we have an emergency and have a boiler or a roof or significant breakup of parking lot somewhere in the short term that will get us through a, a certain time period. We will need to come back to the board with a public discussion at some point in time about uh, what do we want to entertain in the future in terms of a future sinking fund, how do we support technology in the district, what other options are on the table. And we have shared this with the FFO what are the timelines associated with future elections here in the district that have to do with the enhancement millage, our um, operating millage, the hold harmless millage? Uh, we have all that on the calendar now, and I think we need to come back to that at some point relatively soon. Um, um, April or May, we can revisit, revisit this also at our budget workshop uh, the end of April as well. Can you give me those dollar figures again? That you just sure. Um, it is $323,182. Um, this is board general board authorization. Now, when we bring the bids to you, they might look a little different. This is just authorization that allows us to go out and do the bidding of the projects, uh, Mrs. Gordon. And then $20,000 for district concrete replacement. Um, there are some other fees that are associated with that because um, to do the work at Adams requires a 15% contingency. The total cost of those, by the time you look at architect and construction manager fees, is 497139 That's what we anticipate, anticipate it being right now. Okay, thank you. So in other words, we'd only be spending half of what we intended to of the uh, sinking fund projects for this coming summer. And, and Carl, that's going to keep us at a million plus, uh, for lack of a better word, in reserve in the sinking fund for the following year or whatever in terms of some mechanical thing we have to fix that we don't have money in the operating budget to do for like a, ma a major boiler or something of that nature. That is true. So we don't have to go into the operating fund, which only make that $4 million we were talking about worse. Yep. Okay. We have a request to amend for action, if I'm not understanding yep. correctly. Well put. For its pleasure. So moved. Support. Moved by Mr. Wasserman, supported by Mr. Oley. Any further questions? Yes, John. So, Carl, the things that are on the list for sinking fund projects to be done could still be done if we get some certainty and direction from the public and 
collections on sink and fund renewal. I mean, we have what the Dow High lockers. There's a few other things that uh -huh. that could go forward. It's just hard to do in the middle of the year. You know, if you have election in February or March for a renewal, it may have to wait until the following summer. We're going to be in a little bit of a pickle as far as when you start those projects. But so we're proposing a delay, but we also have some money to use in the case of the boiler, the roof, and all that because we may not have a sinking fund. You could have an election for a sinking fund and have it fail. And then it's very clear what you have left. I mean, that's the risk in doing any work, uh, quite frankly. Uh, uh, we think it's timely to do the work at Adams because that building is um, uh, due to have their uh, overhead projection panels put in. It's a, it, it's a more streamlined and, frankly, cost-efficient way for us to do the electrical upgrade and ceiling work at this time. Um, we're in the midst of putting wireless. Um, I think a lot of people know. Uh, some buildings have wireless, but it doesn't work uh, real well in parts of some buildings. We're in the midst of upgrading wireless in, in uh, all the elementary buildings some this summer. That coincides well with this work as well. So uh, it's an ideal time to do the Adams work. Um, whenever you're ready to have a sinking fund election, the FFO knows this. We could bring you, uh, we've got a list together. We can make that list 15 million, we can make it 25 million, we can make it 50 million. There's always needs that are out there. Uh, we'll have to have some conversation for the most part through the uh, FFO committee on, on what you think is um, highest priority of all those. We've and talked, I'm sorry, I was going to say, we've talked a lot about all the things that are ahead of us over the next two, three to five years potentially. Enhancement millage, renewal of the operating millage, seeking fund, what do we do to fund technology, and the list goes on. It's kind of overwhelming, and so we've got to be really prudent about how we do that, how we time it strategically as well as, you know, answering the needs of the community in our district. And it's problematic, but we've got to be very thoughtful about it because we've been very fortunate over 10 years to have that sinking fund, and most districts don't have that. So if you take that sinking fund proceeds from our community of, let's say, roughly 50 million, I'm not sure what the exact number is, 50 million over the last 10 years, and think if we had to take that out of our operating funds, looking at where we stand with our operating budget, we never could have done it. So that means a lot of things will not have been done to maintain the integrity of the facilities of our district. And districts all around us have to struggle with that. Say, I'm going to spend money in the classroom or fix the roof. We're very fortunate we've not been not had to do that. And we don't want to be faced with that either in the future. So I was one that wanted to be ultra conservative to protect as many funds as we have in case we don't have a new sinking fund. We've got to protect our facilities as well because that will always lose in that battle. Um, so, And just two points to make is that by opting for the Adams electrical upgrade, that's a money-saving upgrade as far as energy conservation goes. And the other thing is is that with our technology needs increasing, the sinking fund money can't be used for technology, if I understand. There's limits to that. There are. And I just feel our technology needs going up um, over the next few years. And I, I just, you know, again, I'm just trying to wrestle with all these these options and these ways of funding our needs for the district. That's right. It's going to change over time. Technology is a huge priority. And where does that money come from? Where do we have room in the operating budget now to fund yeah. technology? Short of going out for a bond, which we've talked about, which is a realistic possibility. But do you do a bond and or a sinking fund, one or the other one? What's more important? Yeah. There's a lot of ramifications of both of them. And your renewals at the same time. Exactly. So, yep. And we have to remember the last go around, the board made the decision, uh, to, in case the new members aren't aware, that when we did the enhancement millage, it was not at the best economic situation time to do an enhancement millage, uh, added millage. And we basically offset the collection for enhancement millage by reducing the millage we put on the taxpayers for the sinking fund for that three Three-year period. Period. Right. And that kept the taxpayer neutral. And effectively, we moved money from capital into operating expenses, particularly highlighted to the ones that Carl talked about earlier. Uh, sharing transportation, and when we started busing kids from mills into town, et cetera, that became a much bigger priority. Um, and then the technology and the, um, and the class size as best we could. So we kept the taxpayer neutral for three years as we went through that. Other questions or comments on this? If not, we have a mo um, re request on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You have your amended sinking fund projects. Thank you. You're welcome. I will uh, pass on the superintendent's report and make that up uh, at our next meeting in okay. the essence of time. Okay. Finance and who's I'll handle this. Uh, were you going to handle this? 
Mr. Valenti, I'd, I'd be happy to. It's for your information, the following gifts, which total $3,275, have been received in process. Um, McKay Press has don donated web course for art projects at various MPS schools. The Dow High Music Parents have provided sheet music and music supplies for the H.H. Dow High School to the tune of $2,000. The Chestnut Hill PTO has donated library books for Chestnut Hill, uh, $1,000 uh, for that. And the Stand in the Gap for Educational Excellence through the Midland Area Community Foundation has offered $275 to support the MPS Business Professionals of America, Drama, Debate, Forensics, National Honor Society, and International Affairs. So we'll make good use of those donations and appropriate thanks to the donors as recommended. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Valindi, back to you. Uh, <clears throat> yes, we have uh, one retirement to announce. It's for information. Uh, Lori Wallace, bus driver in transportation, and her effective date is March 16, 2012, and we thank her for her service. Thank you. Okay, uh, in your agenda, we have correspondence to and from the Board of Education. Uh, your next is a schedule activities uh, for the remainder of 2012. And we'll start with discuss, study discussion to my right with Mr. Oley. Yeah, just a, a couple quick things. One is I especially want to kind of shout out to all the people who are responsible for arranging for and pulling off the Booster Bash Friday night. It was an outstanding event. It was like a great example of collaborate, collaboration and teamwork within our district and stuff. And uh, they did a great job. There was an awful lot of people there. And I know they had a lot of money raised in sponsorships. And it was a fun event. And uh, people were in good mood. And I was very impressed with our coaches and athletic directors and teachers being dealers at the casino. And I'm glad they have a day job because I'm not sure they would survive doing that full time. But they did a wonderful job. I was very impressed with the enthusiasm there. The only comment I, I guess I just want to make, um, and maybe to the people that are left here kind of thing, is I've, uh, I've been on the board almost 20 years now. And I don't know if that makes me the oldest board member, but maybe the longest tenured board member as well. And I, uh, every now and then I re kind of reflect back. Um, I'm not sure why I do that. It's just painful sometimes when I do that is without looking at doing a scientific analysis, probably the first 10 years I was on the board, things were very different. We were a growing district. We were increasing students. And, and even after the proposal A came to effect in like 95, there was actually some years where we got an increase in funding. And I remember those days, and I don't know what the percentages were, one, two, three percent, and we used to bemoan the fact we only got a two percent raise in our funding because pre proposal A, we had the latitude of flexibility according to what the wishes of our community were to change our millage rates if the community wanted to support that and we can do our things. And I remember um, when enrollment was going up and funding was either constant or going up a little bit, we were enhancing programs. We were growing programs. We were adding parapros. We were going to middle school concept. We were uh, doing reading recovery. We were doing foreign language in the elementary school and, and on, on, and on. I remember focus initiatives. Some of you, many of you probably were here at that time. And it was kind of a fun, exciting time. The last 10 years, roughly, haven't been quite the same. And especially in the last five years where, unfortunately, enrollment has continued to go down at pretty steep levels. And our funding per pupil, for a variety of reasons, many of which we're talking about tonight, we're going down as well. So we put those combination of those two things. And I, for one, as a board member, generally speaking, would like to think we don't have a deficit budget, just like we can't do that at home. And many years, as you've seen, we've had deficit budgets. But we also said, well, let's maintain a fund balance to protect ourselves from that so we don't ever want to put this district in a crisis situation, like some districts, unfortunately, have had to do over the last several years. So if you think about all the things, and many of them were enumerated tonight, and there's probably many more out there that I can't even think of, where we've had to make program service staffing reductions that have affected all of us. It certainly affects the way you do your job. It affects our kids. It affects our community, media specialists and counselors and pair pros and the number of teachers we have and the class size and athletics and food service workers and custodians and on, on, and on, closing schools, multiple schools that none of us 10 years ago would ever thought would have been needed. With all that we've done, and we've had certainly factions of employees that have reduced salaries, that have started to pay for health care and sacrifices all around the district, and even with all that stuff that many of us that have been around a long time never thought we'd have to do, we're still in a situation where we have kind of a a dim view of what the future might look like. And we hope we're all wrong with that. You know, we don't want to end up with a no fund balance. And we can argue whether it's 10% or 50% or 8% or 4%, whatever it might be. Bottom line is we can't afford to ever allow it to the point where we're in that crisis situation. Because if we are, what's left? What's left to cut, especially if it's mid-year? 
And we've talked about tonight that the only thing that has gone, and, and they haven't gone completely untouched, is busing and athletics. And even the combination of those two, even if we were to eliminate both of those, still wouldn't give us where we need to be. And that's what I find is the frustration here. And I, I sense your frustration and your passion and your energy. And I appreciate all of you guys coming out. Because one of the things we love about our teaching staff and all of our employee groups is the passion and the energy and the enthusiasm and the love for kids that you have. And you showed that tonight. And please, don't misunderstand. We have that too. Maybe we don't show it like you do. Maybe we're not in the classroom every single day. But please don't tell us that we don't care. Because we do. We do very, very much. And we wish we weren't in this situation. We wish you weren't in this situation. It is, and we're doing the best job we can manage it to preserve the longevity of this district for all of us, and more importantly, for the kids that are starting kindergarten and, and our, I would say, my grandkids kind of thing. So that's just kind of a frustration. It's not direct to anybody. It's just like, God, when I look back at my 20 years, it's been not as much fun the last 10 years. I live that. It doesn't mean that we're still not doing phenomenal work because we are, because you are. And one of the things I'm just amazed at, probably not surprised, but I'm so thankful for, that these drastic reductions that we've had for the last many, many years, we still have outstanding <coughs> outcomes. We've got great kids with great parents, the great teachers with a great community, and they're still demonstrating tremendous success. And you deserve an awful lot of credit for that. And so that's the thing we should all be proud of as our district, that even though we have all these challenges, that every other district fails. In some cases, we're facing worse ones than they are. And in many cases, we've not faced as, good, as great challenges as some districts are we still produce some of the top kids in this state. And we all should be proud of that. I really do. So that's it. I'm off my platform. I just thought I needed to say that. <laughs> Angela. All right. Well, I don't know how to follow that one up. <laughs> um, I, I want to do, like you said, Booster Bash was fabulous Friday night. We really enjoyed it, especially the Brandstadt family, knowing we have kids for the next six years who will be in high school. So we really appreciate everything that everyone did to put that together. We had a really enjoyable time. And, and I like all of you, I'm, I'm very frustrated. And you know, that's one of the reasons I got on the board because I wanted to make sure that the data, that I was understanding the data, that I was right there understanding it. And, and it is really sad for me to see where we're at. But I know it's not just Midland. You know, I know it's all over Michigan. Just today I got an email from my high school on the western side of the state asking for money. And you know, it's, it's everywhere. And I just hope that we can get through this and go forward. Thanks. Well, I just want to say, I think you all know, I don't have the 20-year history that Mr. Ole has. In fact, I'm on the very opposite end of that. Um, this is, in fact, my fifth meeting. Um, so uh, I have to say that, I, you know, it's not news to anybody that these are very trying times. That in terms of my being on the board, I, I can only think of it as baptism by fire, because that's kind of what it's been. But um, I really appreciate you all coming tonight. One thing I want to tell you I'm really impressed with is your support for each other. I think that's great. You, you know, we, we wouldn't get anywhere if we didn't support each other. We always have to keep that in mind. I think that we all have to support each other, especially now. Um, and the other thing I want to say is Mr. Oley talked about the outcomes, and I agree with him 100%. I, I mean, we don't have to look very far. And I, I can tell you my daughter received her ACT score today, and we were so happy with that. And again, all I could think of was the scores that come out of the school district. They amaze me over and over and over. They really do. So um, I guess I better quit talking too. But I just want to say, oh, also I want to say that I heard some um, people say some things tonight about feeling sort of underappreciated. And I don't want you to think that I don't appreciate the teachers, the schools, the administrators. I'm probably one of Midland Public Schools' biggest fans. And I will always be one of your biggest fans. So thank you all for coming. Well, I think I'll, I'll continue on that role that I appreciate all of you here. And having been a mom for 26 years straight with kids in the schools, my youngest will graduate. And guess what she's going to be? She's going to Michigan State to be an elementary ed teacher. And uh, my oldest daughter is a high school teacher up in Farwell. So I come from four generations of teachers. And uh, please. As they, others have said, I know you work hard, and I appreciate everything you do. And my ki all five of my kids have had wonderful experiences. Uh, we're waiting for the fourth one to be gainfully employed. She is interviewing tomorrow. And um, I appreciate your heartfelt passion. Um, I will honestly say I will miss it when Sarah is gone next year because I love volunteering in the classrooms. I know many of you. I just spent the weekend with Midland High School school kids up in Traverse City with Mrs. Albright and um, 
Those 10 kids had a marvelous time and represented Midland Public Schools very well amongst 1,500 other high school kids in the state. Um, so what you do is amazing, and we know that you work weekends and nights and early mornings and middle of the night, and uh, it's, it's hard to sit up here. I mean, we volunteer to sit up here because we do care about kids, and we're parents, and we're, some of us have been teachers or we're volunteers, whatever it might be. So bring your passion and, and bring it forth, but please know that you have, you have our respect, and, um, and uh, you will always have that respect. And then on a little night lighter note, um, Booster Bash was fun. It was really fun to see some of you playing a different role and uh, enjoying the evening. And uh, what, a, what a great thing that Midland has pulled together again to do for, for our future athletes. Um, and a couple other things. Uh, I would like also to compliment, I know Mrs. Silva talked about the fire, and when I was there last week, uh, Mr. Jaster took me back. and. Um, had, had wonderful comments for all of you, again, as staff and people in the community and the uh, um, people that are working to, to bring, bring the rooms back up to, back up to par. And um, that, is a real, that is a real tribute to, to all of you and, and, and the MPS family and the Northeast family. I know my daughter, when she heard about it, the one that's a teacher, said um, she heard about Mrs. Silva's room. She, her first thought was, I can't imagine losing all those things that are so special to me in my room, and, and how do I teach the kids? So um, I have heard from Jeff just great things, how people have been displaced in classrooms and, and teachers and kids, and everybody's just working great together. So thank you for all that. And um, tomorrow night, just a little shout, I believe it's tomorrow night, um, is the Spanish. Um, get together that the elementary teachers and students and families are putting together at Central Middle School. So I'm looking forward to, to getting to that. And lastly, I think well-deserved spring break is coming up and hopefully we can all take a few minutes to relax and enjoy our families and um, really truly appreciate all that we have. Even though it is frustrating, um, I think we can really look at how very lucky we are to live in Midland and, and have each other. John? Well, um, I was trying to put together a lot of comments for tonight, and as difficult as it is going through and hearing about your experiences and your impression of what's happening and so forth, uh, it just sometimes, um, you know, my, uh, my thoughts and my announcements kind of go out the window, and I just kind of say it from the heart. And it, it is pretty difficult being up here and seeing what's happened to the district, and um, I appreciate you guys all coming out. It's nice to hear from your end. Um, a lot of information, there's really no way that I can gather or appreciate um, unless talking to you. I've talked to many of you. I've had letters in the mail, emails. I read them all. I appreciate the input. Um, I definitely, uh, I know that we're considering everything from all angles. I know it's not perfect. Um, what I hope is, is that as we look at budget numbers in the future, I think we do need to have that uh, confidence there with our numbers and our figures. And I think it's really hurt the, the district as far as how we all view numbers and the budget and so forth. And I know that you know, we're all in the same boat together. And I just think, well, if we can somehow um, look at an opportunity, the fact finder report is being an opportunity, try to look for the positives, look at the progress that's being done. I'm confident that our MPS family can come up with something and, and move forward. And I don't think this is going to be our only challenge. I think our challenges are going to be ongoing. And I sometimes look at it when I talk to the people in the public too, what is their perspective? Because those are the, those are the future sinking fund millage, bond, re uh, renewal uh, uh, votes that are out there. And I just hope that whatever ends up happening, we show responsibility and we can have some confidence and get things resolved because I want to definitely be viewed in the public as being strong and having ability for us to solve our own problems because I look at what's going on around us. Some uh, sinking fund and enhancement millages are not being passed in some communities. Um, I look at how charter school cap has been lifted and how that can be an opportunity if, if we're in disarray and not getting things taken care of. Uh, and I just look at the increasing standards. And frankly, I just worry about a lot of your morale. I worry about the district morale. I worry about the unity. And that's a lot of what you spoke about today. And a lot of the board members here tonight has talked about the, the high achievement, the continuing high achievement. And Mr. Oley has seen so much happen uh, over the years that it's just amazing that you guys have stepped up and you guys have met that challenge. 
and I really appreciate it. You guys can't get enough credit for what you do. I teach myself on a university level. I know what it's like to manage a classroom. But I've got three kids that are going to be in elementary school next year. I have a business here. I have a house. I can't go anywhere. I'll be the last person that you tell to turn the lights off in Michigan. I'm here. I'm going to make the best of it. And it, it's not difficult. It's not very easy to do this. But I think that we, we have to come together. We have to be able to move forward. And I think that definitely there's a way to do that. So I appreciate you guys being here tonight. Probably be redundant with almost every comment that was made here. Um, thank you for educating my three kids, first of all. Um, they're responsible, about to be grown ups in some cases and grown ups in others. And uh, a lot of you in this room tonight were a big part of that. To the reason I sit on this board is education. It, it, it's nothing else. Uh, it's certainly no fun going through this uh, hard decisions just because you want to be on a board. I don't think any of us up here are doing that. Uh, it's about educating our kids in the future of Midland. The state has dealt us a hand that is, I hate to use the word unfortunate, but almost untenable. And, and we've been reacting to that now for seven years. I first got involved in the district when Focus came up. My biggest concern about Focus was, and I've sat at that podium, and I'll never forget it, um, stood up and made a little speech, like you all did tonight, saying, look, this is great, but how are you going to give more individual attention to the kids with all the things we're asking that teacher to do? And that, I won't say that catalyzed, but it was became part of the program of the paras and the rubrics and everything else. And that's how I got involved. It was concerned about kids' education at the elementary level uh, as we went forward with new programs. As a board member then, years later, it became painful to do those things counselors, the paras, et cetera. The problem is, if we didn't make those moves and don't do some of the things we're talking about going forward, there's a cliff ahead of us. And as I said earlier, that cliff three years ago looked like it was five years away. And last year, it looked like it was about four years away. And now it looks like it's about two years away. And, and so how do we come to a solution that doesn't have any more impact on kids, doesn't have impact on your morale, because I don't want that reflected to the kids in the classroom. I want you eager going to the classes. I want to pay you every penny we can. If the, stro if the state wrote us a check for $10 million more million tomorrow, and I knew it was going to be there forever, we'd look at some of these things that people talked about today, counselors, et cetera. We'd be able to remunerate people. No one's going home with this money in their pockets. It's not like we're investing somewhere else. It's not like we're investing in a charter school somewhere. It's not like we're plowing it into a business. It's none of that. Every penny that comes in is going out the door. Matter of fact, more pennies are going out the door than are coming in. That's the problem. And so how do we balance that? How do we balance that together? I'm, I'm very confident as the negotiating teams get together and they can understand what the picture is, we can find a common solution. The key is everybody, as John stated, agreeing to what the situation really is and what it's going to be in a year or two. Not four and five. We don't have to be great prognosticators. We kind of know our enrollment a couple years from now. And we're pretty confident there isn't a white knight out there that's going to throw a lot of edu dollars, et cetera, at us again for a one-year fix. And so that's what we're faced with. That's what you're faced with. That's what we're all faced with. But to Rick's point, in the meantime, um, you guys are doing great. You and the parents working together, the parents going through hardships with the building closures and kids moving buildings. You've gone through some of that pain with them. And then all this ad pain between the two of you, two parties together are, are doing a wonderful, wonderful job with our kids. And I can't say thank you enough. And I, I'd like to think we do. And I know when I meet you individually, I do say that. So um, let's get through this. It will work. I know it's painful. I know it's money from pockets no matter what we do. And I, that's not desirable. And if we had more, we'd do it, but we don't. That's the problem. I want to say a lot of what's already been said. Um, they say all very well. Um, but I will tell you a couple of things. Uh, nobody sits on this board because it's uh, something that they use to build their ego. Nobody. And if you truly believe that that's the case, then I'd be more than glad to step down tonight. There is no dislike of 
for any of you in this room. And that's the rumors we hear back from also from the community. I'm a product of Midland Public Schools. I'm a chemic. My wife's a charter. My daughters are charters. It's about this community, okay? And I understand your position, but you also have to understand the position we've been put in. And I said this earlier. You know, we were back in the 80s and 90s, we were flush with money. We wouldn't be having this discussion this evening. None of us would be. Rick's lived through it. We unfortunately have experienced the, the negative impact of proposal A, the pen stroke of the Governor Grandholm when she eliminated 20J money and all the other things that have come in between. So I just want to make it clear, there is no dislike up here from anybody on this board, regardless of what rumors you may hear out there. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I know we weren't at the high school wrestling championships this week, but we've been on field trips. We've been on um, uh, field days. We have um, been lunchtime reading buddies in elementary buildings. We've all done that. Every person that sits at this board has done that and will continue to do that. So it's not as that we're just all of a sudden we're board members and we've never experienced any of those issues that you, some of you have talked about tonight. And I'm not trying to be adversarial. I'm just making a, 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 a comment on what everybody up here has participated in as parents. We're not here for the money. We're not here about the money. We get zero for sitting here and listening to all of your concerns and, and better yet, listening to the concerns of the entire community. This is my home. It's your home. We'll get through this and it's going to hurt. But we will get through this. Mr. Ellinger. I'm going to move to something more positive, and that is talk about our students. So um, the booster bass was great on Friday. It was nice to see those of you that could make it there. Uh, you're all very busy. You can't make it to everything. We certainly understand that. But um, the people that were the organizers of Booster Bash, um, I think, created a new standard for fundraising for public schools here. It was pretty incredible uh, what they pulled off. So very well organized and very professionally done. Um, not to offend the Booster Bash planners, um, but I will tell you I attended the uh, Coral Festival Saturday night um, over at Central Middle School. And to see the uh, choral directors from both high schools, all three middle schools, come out and at the end of that program have over 400 kids on stage and in front of the stage and in the aisles in unison singing one song uh, did bring tears to my eyes. It, and it reminded me uh, of why I continue to do what I do. It was just fun to see kids that excited, to see the excitement and the eyes of the young middle school students to think that they could be on a par with the, uh, the, the excellent choirs we have at the high school. It was just really incredible to see. So. Uh, those folks will be getting an, those choral directors will be getting an individual letter from me. And I just thought it was uh, a really neat thing. And the auditorium was packed. You couldn't finally, uh, hardly find a place to sit, including the balcony upstairs. So it was a great event. Uh, moving into the student recognitions for HH Dow High School, we had 33 Dow High School students that had the opportunity to compete with over 2,500 uh, Michigan high school students at the Michigan DECA State Career Development Conference, with a chance to represent Michigan at the DECA International Career Development Conference that's going to be held in Salt Lake City, Utah. The Dow High DECA students did an outstanding job and received numerous awards at the state competition. Four students medaled in their occupational tests. Four students medaled in the role, they, uh, in the role play event. Fifteen students were overall finalists. And the following students will be traveling to Salt Lake City to compete in the international competition in April. Jake Flanagan, Nicole Fisher, Keenan Hammer. Uh, congratulations to all the Dow High DECA students for their hard work and great accomplishment at that state DECA conference. Also at HH Dow High School, the Varsity Competitive Cheer Team recently received an award from the Competitive Cheer Association Coaches of Michigan as having the top Division I GPA in the state. Congratulations to the Dow High Varsity Competitive Cheer. 
A great job to all the students who volunteered to work at the Kids Against Hunger event on Saturday, March 10th. I almost thought this was a typo, but I'm going to read it the way it was given to me. Volunteers packaged 50,466 meals in under four hours worth of time. 50,000, is that even possible? I mean, that's just incredible. A third of those meals will stay right here in Midland County to help feed the hungry. The other two-thirds will be distributed across the U.S. and around the world to where student people are in need of food due to natural disasters. MPS students have proven once again that you care about your community and the world around us. Thank you for donating your time to such a worthy, a worthy cause. That's incredible, 50,000. Um, youth in Government returned uh, Sunday, March 18th from four days of debate and fun in Lansing. Over 900 students participated and less than 20 individual awards were granted. Midland took two of these awards. Three bills passed from our Midland delegation. It was a wonderful accomplishment by these accomplished, civic-minded MPS students. Um, congratulations to the Midland High School Forensics team for bringing home the third place bronze team trophy on Saturday, March 17th uh, at an invitational at Wald Lake Western High School. The team now moves on to regional competition on the 29th. And then Central's forensic team, Central Middle School, has done very well this year also. And a special kudos go out to those um, students. They have already won some high school tournaments in the area. And this past Saturday, the Central Middle School forensics team traveled to the University of Michigan National Invitational Tournament. There were 39 high schools and eight middle schools and nearly 500 individual contestants. The central team ended up fourth place among 15 schools in the Silver Division. However, Central Middle School finished as the top middle school in the tournament, Central Middle School. Also earning honors were Jamie Dwyer, top middle school speaker in broadcasting, Juliet Merillat, hope I didn't murder that, top middle school performer in dramatic interpretation, Sarah Knapp, the top middle school speaker in prose interpretation. This is a phenomenal success and one that I hope we all celebrate and we leave this room, making it a point to send somebody at Central an email letting them know that we're proud of those kids. That's incredible. Congratulations also to uh, the students that participated in the Saginaw Valley State University Math Olympics Friday from the uh, Midland High School. Congratulations to anybody here from Midland High School can help me with this one. Max Dykeisen, okay. who's in? Dykeisen, he's an eighth grader Dykeisen. at Northeast. Okay, <laughs> who took first place overall in the level one test. Also Midland High School level one testers placed third as a team overall amongst area high school students. Congratulations to all who participated and did so well at this event. And this past weekend, BPA students from Midland High competed at the state level and once again placed among the best business students in the state. The following students will be representing Midland High at the national level in Chicago. Sylvia Closen, Clausen, mm -hmm. Trevor Zablocki, Tony Ventura, Chandler Zablocki, Chris McAtee, and Jasmine Soto. Um, so our kids accomplish great things here, but they don't do it by themselves. Lots of adults to help them. That's it, Mr. President. Thank you again for being here, and thank you for those of you who stayed uh, the entire evening. Uh, we're adjourned at 923.